Buonasera. Welcome back home. Bentornati a casa. It's, we are very, very happy. We are we're happy to have you here. Uh, we are sorry for the delays in admission because we still have to check the vaccines. I know no other institution in New York asked for it. <laughs> Be believe me, not my choice. We just need to obey these rules. And from today, masks are no longer mandatory. You are welcome to wear it if you feel more comfortable. That's totally acceptable, but it's no longer a mandate. So this is for the technical boring things. I am delighted that tonight we open this new series called Viva Voce, conceived by my uh, colleague Eugenio Refini. Um, that is really an interdisciplinary series about voice in all its possible manifestations, reception, history. And you will see that from this uh, panel tonight on, a variety of different aspects related to the very concept of voice will be explored. And uh, tonight we start with the bang, as I can tell from your presence here. How many of you were at the opera last night? At the opening, very good, great, great. Eugenio, you were too, right? Very good. One technical piece of information, it's that we are gonna show the film also in the library on the second floor. The screen is more or less as big as this one. But the panel, you will have to watch it here unless they tell me that uh, the setup is ready also for the broadcast of the panel. So you know that if you wanna sit comfortably, you can go to the library and you will see the film in its glory. And since we have a very long evening ahead of us, I'm going to uh, ask Eugenio to come in a second, just, you know, that we're talking about the Greek tragedy, a late Baroque opera and the contemporary film, all together with the greatest soprano of all times, not singing, but acting. <laughs> How many of you thought that coming here you would see Dal uh, Callas singing in a movie? <laughs> she is not. Pasolini, Pasolini wanted Callas in that role, and I think uh, uh, my colleagues are gonna talk about that. But I just want to disabuse you in case you're dying to hear Carla sing it. Not going to happen tonight. Okay, not here at least. So, Pasolini. Her voice is done. Yes, absolutely. It's a, great, it's a great voice anyway, but not her singing voice. Anyway, enough. I've already told you everything I know about the topic, but my colleagues know a lot, and you're about to have a real treat with them. And please welcome Professor Eugenio Refini. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you very much um, for the kind introduction. Thank you for hosting this event. Um, thank you all for being here. It's really such a treat to be here again with, you know, real audience um, to share um, things which we um, love. So uh, I'm really delighted to be uh, doing this tonight. Uh, this is really part of a series which kind of began when we were all in lockdown online. We had a few meetings um, on Zoom, really trying to explore questions of uh, voice, performance, reception. Uh, the Zoom installments went very well, so I thought, uh, let's try to bring these kind of events uh, to real life on our stage here at Casa Italiana. And this is the first um, opportunity. Um, so uh, we are going to have tonight a screening um, of Pierpaolo Pasolini's 1969 Medea, a film which, of course, uh, is extremely important within Pasolini's own career, but, um, you know, of importance in broader terms. Um, why did I come up with the idea of this particular screening? Um, on the one hand, I thought that I would give my little contribution to the um, celebrations of Pasolini's uh, 100th anniversary, uh, which is this year, uh, 2022. Um, and there will be more Pasolini things later um, in the semester. Um, on the other hand, I thought that it would be um, interesting to re-examine Pasolini's Medea while a brand new production of Luigi Cherubini's Medea is opening, indeed it opened triumphantly last night, uh, at the Met. Um, and uh, I thought it would be a great occasion to bring together two of my favorite colleagues here at NYU, Professors Alessandro Barchiesi and Ara Mergian, uh, to help us reflect um, on Pasolini's work vis-a-vis -vis its classical roots. Um, I will introduce them very briefly, uh, for, you know, sort of in the interest of time, I hope they will um, uh, sort of uh, won't mind if, if my introductions are going to be brief, um, and then we will get started with the actual discussion. So Professor Barchiesi is professor of classics um, in the Department of Classics at NYU, which he joined after teaching uh, at the universities of Verona, Siena, Arezzo in Italy, and Stanford, um, a leading scholar in several areas of classics, in fact, too many to be recalled here. His published works include 
and I'm quoting you know, the titles of a few of his monographs, um, Homeric Effects in Virginia Narrative, Speaking Volumes, The Poet and the Prince, Phaeton and the Monsters, among many others. He's not only very interested in the intricacies of the poetic discourse across textuality and theory, as witnessed by his scholarship on Ovid and, and Virgil in particular, but also in the interaction of literary sources and other forms of cultural production, including film, of course. Um, and this is why it is truly great to have him with us tonight. Um, professor Mergen is a professor of Italian studies at NYU and affiliated faculty at the Institute of Fine Arts um, and the Department of Art History. We couldn't be in better hands tonight as Professor Mergen is a renowned specialist of Pasolini. And let me remind his recent monograph, Against the Avant-Garde, Pierpaolo Pasolini, Contemporary Art and Neocapitalism, 1960-1975, uh, which came out with Chicago University Press in 2019. Um, he's also the author of numerous um, studies on 20th century Italian and French art history and theory, futurism and the Italian avant-garde, modernist and post-war aesthetics, uh, and the leading scholar also on Giorgio de Chirico. He has a monograph on de Chirico entitled Giorgio de Chirico and the Metaphysical City, um, and a new one, a forthcoming monograph um, on the Chirico entitled Blueprints and Ruins, Giorgio de Chirico and the Architectural Imagination from the Avant-Garde to Postmodernism. Now, before we start our conversation about Pasolini's Medea, let me go through some um, images. And needless to say, it all begins with ancient Greece, um, specifically with the myth of Medea, which you are all familiar with. Um, you know, sorceress from Colchis, so she's not Greek, she's a foreigner. Um, Medea punishes Jason, uh, the father of her children, who has rejected her in order to marry another woman, the daughter of the king of Corinth, Creon. How does she punish Jason? She poisons the bride and the king, and she kills her own children before flying away on a chariot led by dragons. The myth was canonized by Euripides in the 5th century BC, and it has really haunted Western culture for centuries. Um, and it is from Euripides that Pasolini li literally took this story, this particular myth. Um, and uh, what is crucial here is that uh, Pasolini turned to the by then retired soprano Maria Callas for the role of Medea. And this is where Cherubini's opera, in a way, comes into play. Uh, Cherubini's opera was also based on Euripides' tragedy. Uh, this opera by Cherubini was first given in French, in France and in French, in 1797. So the original libretto is indeed a French libretto. It, the opera was given in German after um, a few years, um, then was translated into Italian. Um, and the opera had his modern revival with no other than Maria Callas herself, who sang the role of Medea several times from 1953, when the opera opened, so to speak, in Florence, to 1961, 1962. Uh, and here I would like to just briefly show a few pictures from the various productions of Cherubini's Medea, where Maria Callas um, sang. Um, this is the original production of Callas's Medea, Florence, 1953, Milan, Scala, the very same year, December, 1953. And I would like you to pay attention to both you know, the settings and the costumes because they are very different from what we do see in Pasolini's Medea. And that's an interesting question to raise with our presenters uh, tonight. Um, this is um, another uh, set of images from uh, La Scala. London, 1959, and this is, sorry, sort of um, mismatched, uh, Dallas, 1958, a very important production, um, and Epidaurus in Greece, 1961. Um, the following images which I have here have been selected by Professor Mergen, and they really refer to Pasolini's Medea. Um, they're very beautiful, and ho hopefully we will have some time to um, talk about them as well. Uh, I will just go through them quickly before we um, begin our conversation. Medea here, so Callas and Pasolini. The beautiful costumes by Piero Tosi. 
and here you see images of the actors wearing those costumes. Um, then some um, offstage pictures, again, of Pasolini and Callas, a very interesting relationship about something might be said. <laughs> and also some beautiful photographs which Professor Mergen put together from um, Pasolini and Callas vacations in Greece in the very same year. And also something which I learned actually talking to Professor Mergen, um, Pasolini's um, portraits of Callas, uh, which kind of date back to this particular time period. And um, it is on this particular set of um, portraits of Callas um, made by Pasolini, which I would like to conclude this very brief um, um, showcase of images. And I would like to turn to our um, um, guests tonight for a proper uh, chat about Pasolini's Medea. So please join me in welcoming Professor Barchiesi and Professor Mergen to the podium. Great, so um, let's get started right away. And uh, I think we might want to begin with Professor Mergen, um, really to begin with Pasolini. And uh, I would like to ask you, um, Ara, you know, to tell us a little bit about the particular place of the film, Medea 1969, within the broader um, sort of um, oeuvre of Pasolini. Sure. <coughs> so this was uh, Pasolini's 12th film in nine years. Um, he had made his first sort of major cinematic debut with his first feature-length film, Accatone, although uh, he had done some work in the film, writing, uh, helping on the script for Fellini's uh, Notti di Caviria, uh, but it was really in the early 60s with uh, Accatone and Mamma Roma that he had made a debut which engaged quite explicitly with uh, the history of neorealist cinema. By the end of the decade, uh, Pasolini's sort of hopes for not only for the cinema and for culture, but for Italy at large, had been thrashed by what he perceived to be a mutation on what he called an anthropological level. Um, by the end of the 1950s, uh, Italy had undergone a transformation unparalleled in its history from a still predominantly sort of agrarian country to one wholly subsumed to consumerist plenty um, and awash in the new appliances and um, niceties of the free market. Um, a situation which you know, benefited some um, and certainly transformed uh, the middle class, but which also, in Pasolini's eyes, leveled the cultural diversity uh, and marginalized communities which made Italy, and still in many ways, linguistically, culturally, regionally, makes Italy unique in the seeming infinite variety of, um, of its cultural expressions. Um, and he actually compared it, you know, Pasolini was um, in, in many ways, had, a, had an almost kind of vatic, um, uh, ancient sense of uh, apocalypse and doom, and he called it, um, he compared it to genocide, it's like a cultural genocide, um, that Italy's um, cultural variety was essentially being flattened by what he perceived as neo-capitalist and consumerist leveling, um, uh, to put it quite simply and, and synthetically. And so in some ways this is the context in which he made Medea, um, a context in which he had essentially withdrawn from a sense of using the cinema to engage um, with a wider public. His version of Medea, although it adheres very quite closely to um, Euripides' play, as, as Sandra will likely tell us, um, it's not a generous film. It's a difficult film. It's a rebarbative film. Just as Medea herself is, um, in many ways, a, 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 a scary figure who is also deeply angry for ma various reasons. And there are many and the autobiographical points of intersection for both Pasolini and for Callas. Um, 
in Medea's refusal, in a sense, to be um, subsumed into the world of of Corinth's order and business as usual and Jason's um, career ambition, we find echoes of Pasolini's own sort of refusal and also his retreat increasingly into myth, um, into the medieval period, away from the contemporary. The Pasolini was essentially allergic to his own time um, for various reasons. Um, and for Kalas, who had recently been jilted um, by Onassis, um, Medea's uh, betrayal by Jason obviously resonated for her in um, some quite personal terms. Now, as we saw on the screen, they became fast friends. There were even rumors in the press that they were engaged, which was completely apocryphal, um, although it did not begin um, on such sort of glowing terms. Um, Kalas was, uh, uh, you know, had her own profound kind of bourgeois sensibilities. She evidently even walked out of Pasolini's film Teorema the year before, 1968, because uh, this unnamed guest played by Terence Stamp visits the family in a kind of allegory of the unraveling of the bourgeois mind and all four members of the family sleep with this guest in a kind of, as a sort of supernatural force. And she walked out of the film and said to, um, uh, you know, said to complain to one of her friends about Marxists and homosexuals, um, which of course Pasolini essentially was the ap apotheosis of both, right? She even went to a fortune teller in Paris to decide whether or not she should take the role when Pasolini proposed it to her, which of course for Pasolini recommended her all the, all the more since Medea is a sorceress in touch with sort of supernatural otherworldly forces. To make a long story short, she accepted the role and it was a, a great success um, for both of them. But as um, Stefano mentioned earlier, uh, Pasolini did not want Medea, uh, did not want Callas the, um, the opera diva. He wanted Callas um, for her presence, for her face, for her embodiment as what he perceived to be a kind of primitive, in the good sense, Greekness and otherness. Um, uh, as we'll see, uh, Medea comes from Colchis, from the East. And so the world that Pasolini evokes with Medea is a, a pre-Socratic Greece of mystery, of human sacrifice. Uh, Pasolini actually was even going quite overboard. He wanted there to be not just one scene of human sacrifice, um, but three. He also wanted the, there to be a scene of copulation involving a bull, which did not happen for better or worse. I can't tell you. But the point is, is that um, the world of um, this, uh, this East on the edges of the classical world is evoked through various kinds of anthropological and, and ethnographic textures, which um, are meant to evoke its sort of strangeness um, and its uh, this sense of of otherness to the sort of sophrosine and uh, classical order of of the Greek world. So that's just sort of a brief synopsis. Well, thank you. I mean, this was really amazing, and I think you did sort of uh, uh, yes, yes, please. Um, a round of applause. Um, you did bring up many interesting questions, and I think I will just um, sort of fetch a couple of them and sort of turn. Um, then on to Professor Berchiesi, the question of, you know, sort of otherness, this idea of Medea as an other uh, is also resonant with uh, Pasolini's relationship to the classical world. And so I think one question here is, you know, what Euripides are we going to see in the movie and what kind of relationship did Pasolini have with classical antiquity? Well, thank you very much. Allow me just a couple of personal notes. Uh, Ciao Stefano. It's, it's a great pleasure to be back. It's, um, you know, the Casa Italiana matters a lot. And um, as we say in Italian, uh, ci sei mancato grande tempo. We, we missed you big time. <laughs> that's, not, that's not an Italian expression, but. So it, it's great to see you all. And um, yes, the, the occasion is truly important. Um, unfortunately, this is the centenary of, of Pasolini, so it's obvious, right? Everybody will come here and, and tell you that it is um, truly important. Uh, but yes, um, Pasolini matters. Um, it matters. He matters to me personally. Um, I'm going to say a few things as a, as a classicist in a moment, but also as a citizen. Uh, first of all, 
I remember where I was uh, when I, I had the news of his death. Uh, this happened to me with, you know, the moon landing or 9-11, or so I still remember that moment. Um, second, when I was preparing for this meeting, I was reminded that the best uh, scholar on Pasolini and classics, um, Massimo Fusillo, um, was the victim of a homophobic attack in Rome a few years ago by people who I believe are connected with a, a group oddly named Casa Pound. So, you know, um, the new government is sending messages of friendship and reconciliation, but we should keep our eyes open. Let, let's do it for Pasolini as well. Uh, and what can I say? Um, the connection between Pasolini and antiquity is very interesting. But I, I just want you to remember just a couple of things. First of all, the tragedy itself is transgressive because we sometimes think about classics as something, you know, reassuring, uh, always um, sanctified and, yes, classical. But as far as we know, Medea is a transgressive innovation by Euripides. So this is not a story that he picked from a traditional repertoire. Uh, it was quite innovative, especially the murder of the children. So maybe something was connecting Pasolini uh, to a text that was, had been really daring uh, in its own time. Uh, second, this is a turning point in the history of um, adaptation and re the remaking of antiquity. Of course, we all remake uh, our own antiquity. It is uh, just, as, just like we remake the past. So antiquity is constantly being um, recreated. But this movie is particularly significant because it is one of the first visual recreations of antiquity as the third world. That was the expression back in the, the 1960s. So one of the first time that you see antiquity as something that looks like um, not only a foreign country, but an uh, old, old country. Uh, so the way Pasolini is using the colors, the costumes, the rituals, um, even the fact that people laugh in some odd moments, this is all intended as, we might say, the othering uh, of antiquity, the denaturalization uh, of antiquity, and that is a, per se a very important project. Uh, it, it's basically started at the beginning of the 20th century with the massive importance of anthropology and archaeology that was changing the panorama and the approach to, to ancient stories and recreations. But it is very difficult to find uh, something earlier than, than Medea in this uh, perspective. Uh, even some of the protagonists of, of the new meeting between, let's say, antiquity and Africa, people like Soinka, as far as I know, are later than the work by Pasolini. So I wanted you to remember that, to think that this was a very innovative movie in its own time. And, and I just wanted to add a, a final question for you, which is, I think, unavoidable, and that's Maria Callas. So I would like you to think whether you think that she is right for the movie, uh, there are various opinions about that. We can all say that Pasolini did not want the diva. My personal impression is that he wanted the diva, <laughs> just for a couple of reasons. The one that I can say now is that Medea was always gr bigger than life, greater than life. She kind of exceeds her own tragedy. No one is as big as Medea. Think about the fact that she never dies. There is no myth about the death of Medea. She doesn't become a goddess either. So she simply goes on and on, and she's so much greater than the other characters on stage. So I think one positive spin to this question would be he wanted a Maria because she was, yes, the, the diva. And maybe this also explains why Jason was uh, oddly picked up from uh, 
Olympian uh, athletes. He was, uh, before the movie, as far as I know, he was uh, an Olympian athlete, uh, so not famous for being, you know, articulate or for being a speaker. So he clearly wanted this imbalance. So those are the things that come to mind right now, but I'm sure Eugenio will wrap up. Well, thank you, Alessandro, because I mean, these are also uh, very good points um, here. Yes, please, let's... Uh, um, and actually, building, building on that, sort of a thought which comes to my mind, and this is really for you know, both of you, is that um, you know, what we are going to see in the movie is, as you were saying, um, a Greece, an ancient Greece, which is very different from you know, Winkelmann's Greece. It's not the idealized sort of classical Greece, which you know, centuries of post-Renaissance culture have built uh, uh, for us. So um, it's a very sort of um, uh, decolonial gaze on ancient Greece before uh, the decolonial discourse really um, uh, became something um, uh, sort of um, widespread in even in scholarship. But what is interesting in the film is that there is a very strong tension between the world of media and the world of uh, civilization, right? So we have cultures, uh, which is really represented as this kind of, you know, barbarous world. Um, it's uh, the, those scenes are set in Turkey, in Cappadocia. So the setting has nothing to do with the image of Greece, of course, which we have. And then when we get to Corinth, the kingdom of Creon, uh, we are in this very interesting location, which sort of um, outside we do see the walls of a city, uh, again in a sort of desert um, land. But then when we get inside, um, that's the triumph of um, sort of um, uh, beauty in a way because the court of Corinth is set in the uh, Piazza dei Miracoli in Pisa. So, you know, the, uh, all the area around the Cathedral of Pisa, the Leaning Tower, and of course the Campo Santo Monumentale. It's yeah, a that's something I want you to answer for me, Eugenio, because we both studied in Pisa. Yes. And I think the question will, will come, why Pisa? Why Pisa? I mean, of course, something I think interesting there is that we do have a set of marble, which in a way does remind us of ancient Greece, but at the very same time is something embedded in Italian culture, in Italian history, and that's, you know, the later Middle Ages. It's not even the Renaissance yet. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting choice on the part of, of Pasolini. So I'm wondering, you know, what kind of um, questions, again, this tension between the two worlds um, raise, and how can we respond to that uh, from our sort of perspective 52 years um, after the appearance of, of the movie? Um, so, any thoughts you might have on this particular thing um, would be. Well, I think he, I think in part he chose Pisa because you know uh, associations with Galileo and at least sort of the uh, you know it, it's still a Renaissance city in many ways, right? So um, it was meant to sort of symbolize the the entry of the classical world into this kind of canonized. Um, uh, you know the world of of reason and everything that Medea you know represented the opposite of really. Um, uh, the other thing I was going to say was that um, uh, yes, they filmed it in in Cappadocia. You know the the scenes of Colchis, particularly the beginning in Cappadocia. There are um, many of the lagoon scenes um, are were filmed near um, up above Venice um, and. Uh, Sandro's remark about sort of denaturalization is absolutely um, uh, sort of the the real crux of everything. You know, there, you'll notice the dialogue with the centaur at the beginning um, when he says to the young Jason, you know, if nature becomes, if nature comes to seem natural to you, then everything is finished. Um, and for Pasolini, even in, on a formal level, Pasolini claimed to hate naturalism. Um, he said, I want to recreate everything. And that extends even to dialogue. Callas read her lines in English, but she's dubbed in Italian. Um, there is everywhere in, in, in the film and in his work at large a sense of kind of, of pastiche and of um, what he called contamination. Um, contamination between epics, between locales, between registers of high and low. So it, it, particularly, you know, the fact that Jason is played by um, a gold medal winning um, long jumper who won the gold in the ni 1968 Olympics in Mexico, 
and uh, Medea is played by Kala. So the sense of, of constant contamination, but also a resistance to naturalism in, in, every, um, in every way. Um, one, one final thing that you'll notice is um, the particular ways in which Kalas is, is framed and staged vis-a-vis -vis nature. Um, and Pasolini, you know, this was his own particular kind of fetishization of Kalas's Greekness. Um, and, you know, with regard to the classics, he even, you know, he spoke of how even her profile, her big nose in profile reminded him of, these, of Attic vases, of the profiles on Attic vases, right? There's the sense of her as a kind of physically um, that she came from the people, even though she became a bourgeoise through her upbringing here in, in the United States, in fact, she was, she came from sort of humble peasant stock. And this for Pasolini, um, this sense of her, her in seemingly intrinsic um, otherness uh, was as important to him as, as anything else that, that Kala seemed to have. And this relates also to his portraits of her, which he, he made using grass and crushed, um, uh, crushed uh, materials that he found on the beach and wine and coffee, natural materials. So this is sort of identification of her with the primitive, with the, with, with the earth, really. And you'll see in the movie how, um, how much when, when Medea is disoriented, it's to the earth that she turns rather than to, to Greek reason. I think the movie will speak for itself, but I will be curious to know your reactions afterwards. And I think, yes, uh, just a very final point, uh, and then we will wrap things up and we will enjoy the movie. Um, just one, I think, interesting thing to think about is also um, the question of um, repeating things, because you will see that at some point, I mean, I won't sp sort of spoil it, but at some point, there's something which happen which happens twice. Um, and I think that's a very interesting thing. Um, and uh, again, uh, this very same thing happens twice with some changes and I think that's also a very interesting example of what Ara you were saying about is sort of artificial way of telling stories which Pasolini is endorsing here. There's nothing sort of naturalist about the way in which the story um, is told and the, the, the spectator is actually um, required to do quite an important job when um, watching this movie. So, you know, it's not an easy movie, as you were saying, and uh, one needs really to sort of digest every single detail um, um, quite significantly. So, well, I would like to thank uh, Professor Barchese and Professor Mergen for really sort of introducing us to uh, Pasolini's Medea. Thank you all for being here and um, enjoy the film. <laughs>